It is not at all difficult for persons in good health to make money. In this comparatively new field, there are so many avenues of success open, so many vocations which are not crowded, that any person of either sex who is willing, at least for the time being, to engage in any respectable occupation that offers, may find lucrative employment. Those who really desire to attain an independence have only to set their minds upon it and adopt the proper means, as they do in regard to any other object which they wish to accomplish. And the thing is easily done. But however easy it may be found to make money, I have no doubt many of my hearers will agree it is the most difficult thing in the world to keep it. The road to wealth is, as Dr. Franklin truly says, as plain as the road to the mill. It consists simply in expending less than we earn. That seems to be a very simple problem. Mr. Micawber, one of those happy creations of the genial Dickens, put the case into strong light when he says that to have annual income of 20 pounds per annum and spend 20 pounds and six pence is to be the most miserable of men, whereas to have an income of only 20 pounds and spend but 19 pounds and six pence is to be the happiest of mortals. Many of my readers may say, we understand this. This is economy, and we know economy is wealth. We know we can't eat our cake and keep it also. Yet I beg to say that perhaps more cases of failure arise from mistakes on this point than almost any other. The fact is, many people think they understand economy when they really do not. True economy is misapprehended, and people go through life without properly comprehending what that principle is. One says, I have an income of so much, and here is my neighbor who has the same. Yet every year he gets something ahead, and I fall short. Why is it? I know all about economy. He thinks he does, but he doesn't. There are men who think that economy consists in saving cheese parings and candle ends and cutting off two pence from the laundless bill and doing all sorts of little mean, dirty things. Economy is not meanness. The misfortune is also that this class of persons let their economy apply in only one direction. They fancy they are so wonderfully economical in saving a half penny where they ought to spend two pence. They think they can afford to squander in other directions a few years ago before kerosene oil was discovered or thought of. One might stop overnight at almost any farmer's house in the agricultural districts, districts and get a very good supper. But after supper he might attempt to read in the sitting room and would find it impossible with the inefficient light of one candle. The hostess seeing this dilemma would say, it is rather difficult to read here. Evenings, the proverb says, you must have a ship at sea in order to be able to burn two candles at once. We never have an extra candle except on extra occasions. These extra occasions occur perhaps twice a year. In this way, the good woman saves five, six, or ten dollars in that time. But the information which might be derived from having the extra light would, of course, far outweigh a ton of candles. But the trouble does not end here. Feeling that she is so economical in tallow candles, she thinks she can afford to go frequently to the village and spend twenty or thirty dollars for ribbons and fur bellows, many of which are not necessary. This false connote may frequently be seen in men of business, and in those instances and often runs to writing paper. You find good businessmen who save all the old envelopes and scraps and would not tear a new sheet of paper if they could avoid it for the world. This is all very well. This is all very well. They may in this way save five or ten dollars a year, but being so economical only in note paper, they think they can afford to waste time, to have expensive parties, and to drive their carriages. This is an illustration of Dr. Franklin's saving at the spigot and wasting at the bung hole. Penny wise and pound foolish. Punch in speaking of this. One idea class of people says they are like the man who bought a penny herring, herring for his family's dinner and then hired a coach and four to take it home. I never knew a man to succeed by practicing this kind of economy. True economy consists in always making the income exceed the outgo. Wear the old clothes a little longer, if necessary. Dispense with the new pair of gloves. Mend the old dress. 
Live on plainer food if need be, so that under all circumstances, unless some unforeseen accident occurs, there will be a margin in favor of the income, a penny here and a dollar there. Placed at interest goes on accumulating, and in this way the desired result is attained. It requires some training, perhaps, to accomplish this economy, but when once used to it, you will find there is more satisfaction in rational saving than in irrational spending. Here is a recipe which I recommend. I have found it to work an excellent cure for extravagance and especially for a mistaken economy. When you find that you have no surplus at the end of the year and yet have a good income, I advise you take a few sheets of paper and form them into a book and mark down every item of expenditure. Post it every day or week in two columns, one headed necessaries or even comforts and the other headed luxuries and you will find that the latter column will be double trouble and frequently ten times greater than the former. The real comforts of life cost but a small portion of what most of us can earn. Dr. Franklin says, it is the eyes of others and not our own eyes which ruin us. If all the world were blind except myself I should not care for the clothes or furniture. It is the fear of what Mrs. Gundy may say that keeps the noses of many worthy families to the grindstone. In America, many persons like to repeat, we are the free and equal, but it is a great mistake in more senses than one. That we are born free and equal is a glorious truth in one sense, yet we are not all born equally rich, and we never shall be. One may say there is a man who has an income of $50,000 per annum, while I have but $1,000. I knew that fellow when he was poor like myself. Now he is rich and thinks he is better than I am. I will show him that I am as good as he is. I will go and buy a horse and buggy. No, I cannot do that. But I will go and hire one and ride this afternoon on the same road that he does, and thus prove to him that I am as good as he is. My friend, you need not take the trouble. You can easily prove that you are as good as he is. You have only to behave as well as he does. But you cannot make anybody believe that you are as rich as he is. Besides, if you put on these airs, add waste your time and spend your money, your poor wife will be obliged to scrub her fingers off at home and buy her tea two ounces at a time and everything else in proportion in order that you keep up appearances and after all deceive nobody. On the other hand, Mrs. Smith may say that her next door neighbor married Johnson for his money and everybody says so. She has a nice $1,000 Colonel's hair shawl and she will make Smith get her an imitation one and she will sit in a pew right next to her neighbor in church in order to prove that she is her equal. My good woman, you will not get ahead in the world if your vanity and envy thus take the lead. In this country where we believe the majority ought to rule, we ignore that principle in regards to fashion and let a handful of people calling themselves the aristocracy run up a false standard of perfection. And in endeavoring to rise to that standard, we constantly keep ourselves poor, all the time digging away for the sake of outside appearances. How much wiser to be a law unto ourselves and say we will regulate our outgo by our income and lay up something for a rainy day. People ought to be as sensible on the subject of money getting as on any other subject like causes producers like effect. You cannot accumulate a fortune by taking the road that leads to poverty. It needs no profit to tell us that those who live fully up to their means without any thought of a reverse in this life can never attain a pecuniary independence. Men and women accustomed to gratify every whim and caprice will find it hard at first to cut down their various unnecessary expenses and will feel it a great self-denial to live in a smaller house than they have been accustomed to. With less expensive furniture, less company, less costly clothing, fewer servants, a less number of balls, parties, theater goings, carriage ridings, pleasure excursions, cigar smokings, liquor drinkings, and other extravagances. But after all, if they will try the plan of laying 
buy a nest egg, or in other words, a small sum of money at interest, or judiciously invested in land, they will be surprised at the pleasure to be derived from constantly adding to their little pile, as well as from all the economical habits which are engendered by this course. The old suit of clothes and the old bonnet and dress will answer for another season. The croton or spring water tastes better than champagne. A cold bath and a brisk walk will prove more exhilarating than a ride in the finest coach. A social chat, an evening's reading in the family circle, or an hour's play at hunt and slipper. The blind man's bluff will be far more pleasant than a fifty or five hundred dollar party. When the reflection on the difference in cost is indulged, and by those who begin to know the pleasure of saving, thousands of men are kept poor, and tens of thousands are made so after they have acquired quite sufficient to support them well through life. In consequence of laying their plans of living on too broad a platform, some families expend $20,000 per annum, and some much more, and would scarcely know how to live on less while others secure more solid enjoyment frequently on a twentieth part of that amount. Prosperity owes more severe ordeal than adversity, especially sudden prosperity. Easy come, easy go is, is an old and true proverb. A spirit of pride and vanity, when permitted to have fail sway, is the undying canker worm which gnaws the very vitals of a man's worldly possessions. Let them be small or great, hundreds or millions, Many persons, as they begin to prosper immediately, expand their ideas and commence expending their luxuries until in short time their expenses swallow up their income and they become ruined in their ridiculous attempts to keep up appearances and make a sensation. I know a gentleman of fortune who says that when he first began to prosper, his wife would have a new and elegant sofa. That sofa, he says, cost me $30,000. When the sofa reached the house, it was found necessary to get chairs to match, then sideboards, carpets, and tables to correspond with them, and so on through the entire stock of furniture, when at least it was found that the house itself was quite too small and old-fashioned for the furniture, and a new one was built to correspond with the new purchases. Thus, added my friend, summing up an outlay of $30,000 caused by that single sofa, and saddling on me in the shape of servants, equipage, and the necessary expenses attendant upon keeping up a fine establishment, a yearly outlay of $11,000 and a tight pinch at that, whereas ten years ago we lived with much more real comfort because with much less care on as many hundreds, the truth is, he continued, the sofa would have brought me to the inevitable bankruptcy had not a most unexemptable title and prosperity kept me above it, and had I not checked the nature of desire to cut a dash. The foundation of success in life is good health. That is the, subs the substratum fortune. It is also the basis of happiness. A person cannot accumulate a fortune very well when he is sick. He has no ambition, no incentive, no force. Of course, there are those who have bad health and cannot help it. You cannot expect that such persons can accumulate wealth, but there are a great many in poor health who need not be so. If then sound health is the foundation of success and happiness in life, how important it is that we should study the laws of health, which is but another expression for the laws of nature. The nearer we keep to the laws of nature, the nearer we are to good health. And yet how many persons there are who pay no attention to natural laws, but absolutely transgress them, even against their own natural inclination. We ought to know that the sin of ignorance is never winked at in regard to the violation of nature's laws. Their infraction always brings the penalty. A child may thrust its finger into the flames without knowing it will burn, and so suffers. Repentance even will not stop the smart. Many of our ancestors knew very little about the principle of ventilation. They did not know much about oxygen. Whatever other gin they might have been acquainted with, and consequently they built their houses and little seven by nine feet bedrooms, and these good old pious Puritans would lock themselves up in one of these cells and say their prayers and go to bed, and in the morning they would devoutly return thanks for the preventative of their lives, 
during the night and nobody had better reason to be thankful. Probably some big crack in the window or in the door let in a little fresh air and thus saved them. Many people knowingly violate the laws of nature against their better impulses. For the sake of fashion, for instance, there is one thing that nothing living except a vile worm will naturally love, and that is tobacco. Yet, how many persons there are who deliberately train an unnatural appetite and overcome this implanted aversion for tobacco to such a degree that they get to love it? They have got hold of a poisonous, filthy weed, or rather that takes a firm hold of them. Here are married men who run about splitting tobacco juice on the carpet and floors, and sometimes even upon their wives' besides. They do not kick their wives out of doors like drunken men, but their wives, I have no doubt, often wish they were outside of the house. Another perilous feature is that this artificial appetite like jealousy grows by what it feeds on. When you love that which is unnatural, a stronger appetite is created for the hurtful thing that the natural desire for what is harmless. This is an old proverb which says that habit is second nature, but an artificial habit is stronger than nature. Take for instance an old tobacco chewer. His love for the quid is stronger than his love for any particular kind of food. He can give up roast beef easier than he can give up the weed. Young lads regret that they are not men. They would like to go to bed boys and wake up men. And to accomplish this, they copy the bad habits of their seniors. Little Tommy and Johnny see their fathers or uncles smoking a pipe, and they say, man, if I could do that, I would be a man too. Uncle John has gone out on the left his pipe of tobacco. Let's try it. They take a match and light it and, and then puff away. We will learn to smoke. Do you like it, Johnny? That lad doubtfully replies, not very much. It tastes bitter. But, and by he grows pale, but he persists and soon offers up a sacrifice on the altar of fashion. But boys stick to it and persevere until at last they conquer that unnatural appetite and become the victims of acquired taste. I speak by the book, for I have noticed its effects on myself, having gone so far as to smoke 10 or 15 cigars a day. Although I have not used the weed during the last 14 days and never shall again, the more man smokes, the more he craves smoking. The last cigar smoked simply excites the desire for another, and so on incessantly. Take the tobacco chewer in the morning when he gets up. He puts a quid in his mouth and keeps it there all day, never taking it out except to exchange it for a fresh one. Or when he is going to eat, oh, yes, at intervals during the day and evening, many a chewer takes out the quid and holds it in his hand long enough to take a drink, and then pop it goes back in. This simply proves that the appetite for rum is, is even stronger than that for tobacco. When the tobacco chewer goes to your county seat and you show him your grapery and fruit houses and the beauties of your garden, when you offer him some fresh ripe fruit and say, my friend, I have got here the most delicious apples and pears and peaches and apricots. I have imported them from Spain, France, and Italy. Just see those luscious grapes. Then is nothing more delicious nor more healthy than ripe fruit. So help yourself. If I want to see you delight yourself with these things, he will roll the dear quid under his tongue and answer, No, thank you. I have got tobacco in my mouth. His palate has become narcoticized by the noxious weed, and he has lost in a great measure the delicate and inviolable taste for fruits. This shows that expensive, useless, and injurious habits men will get into. I speak from experience. I have smoked until I tremble like an aspen leaf. The blood rushed to my head, and I had a palpitation of the heart, which I thought was heart disease, till I was almost killed with fright. Then I consulted my physician, and he said, break off tobacco. I was not only injuring my health and spending a great deal of money, but I was setting a bad example. I obeyed his counsel. No young man in the world ever looked so beautiful as he thought he did behind a 15-cent cigar or a nursham. These remarks apply with tenfold force to the use of intoxicating drinks. To make money requires a clear brain. A man has got to see that two to two make four, and he must lay all his plans in reflection and forethought. 
and closely examine all the details and the ins and outs of business, as no man can succeed in business unless he has a brain to enable him to lay his plans, and reason to guide him in their execution. So no matter how bountiful a plan may be blessed with intelligence, if the brain is muddled and his judgment warped by intoxicating drinks, it is impossible for him to carry on business successfully. How many good opportunities have passed never to return while a man was sipping a social glass with his friend, or how many foolish bargains have been made under the influence of the Nervine, which temporarily makes its victim think he is rich? How many important dis chances have been put off until tomorrow, and then forever, because the wine cup has thrown the system into a state of lassitude, neutralizing the energy so essential to success in business? Verily, wine is a mocker. The use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage is as much an infatuation as is smoking of the opium by the Chinese, and the former is quite as destructive to the success of the businessman as the latter. It is an unlitigated evil, utterly indefensible in the light of philosophy, religion, or good sense. It is the parent of nearly every other evil in our country. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to catch the next chapter.